I often see people complaining about the... It's not just a, a Rust thing, but I'll see this with, like, typed languages as well. People complaining about the compiler telling them they're doing something wrong. The compiler's telling you you're doing something wrong because you're probably doing something wrong. Like a... Uh, my my, yes. my my favorite example of this is anytime you take a, a JavaScript developer and stick them in TypeScript and you have a type system that's actually there... Like, they get very confused because the compiler's telling them they're not allowed to, like, do certain things with types. Like, yes, because what you're trying to do is a bad idea, so stop doing it. And I'm sure Rust is much the same in that way, where it's like, stop doing that. Like, the compiler is complaining because that's a bad idea, so stop it. Yeah, though, I, I would say that Rust goes further, mm, because it also, sure. like, manages ownership of va values. Yep. And that, that's what tripping off a lot of programmers. Mm -hmm. And yeah, because, you know, it tells you that if multiple things own something and they have, you know, mutable access to it, um, you might have a different state than you expect this value to be and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like quite heavily enforced. Um, yeah. Some people just, I mean, it, it's sometimes a little bit annoying because you have to write code in a way where you don't run into those issues. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would also say that it generally leads to cleaner code anyway. Or more, like, it's easier to, from, from a, um, thinking about the code perspective, because a lot of the errors you can just, you know, page out of your brain. It, don't have to think about certain issues anymore. Mm -hmm. um, like in C, it's totally fine to return an address to stack memory, and maybe the compiler complains, maybe it doesn't. <laughs> um, yeah, stuff like this. So as you were learning Rust, how did you go about doing so while writing this driver? Did you just like look at the documentation for Rust and just wing it, basically? Like, what was what was your approach? Yeah, I think it's basically that. Um, they have this uh, introduction thing on the Rustlink website, I think, mm -hmm. um, which I looked into. Um, it was just, you know, basic stuff on how to write Rust code and sure, stuff. Sure, yeah. nothing really complicated. Um, but yeah, but then at some point I just say, okay, I want to write code. I'm not really a good, you know, documentation reader. So mm -hmm. documentation is kind of things I avoid. And, um, like documentation in the sense of, uh, you know, big block of text on right, how to do right. something. Um, mm -hmm. I, I look into the reference, uh, if it's reference manual, I don't know, but like the, um, actual documentation of the um, standard library. Right. Um, that's something I usually look a lot into. And they have examples there on how to use code and uh, how to use the functions in Python and everything. Mm -hmm. So how long did, do you reckon it took you to start feeling comfortable writing Rust code? Not quite sure. I... I don't know if I'm uh, comfortable yet at the level where I can say, okay, I know what I'm doing. Sure. Um, um, but I'm comfortable enough to, you know, just write code and the compiler is not getting too much into my way. Um, I think there's still like a lot I need to learn and more, uh, you know, write code, more idiomatic and stuff like this, but I think it's not too bad. See, most people would have answered, I feel comfortable now. Like, you have a Rust implementation of OpenCL in the Mesa project, and you're like, I don't feel comfortable writing Rust yet. No, I mean, from a, um, or is this code, like, optimal enough, or is there a way to do it better, and stuff like this. Sure. Um, but yeah, I can write code, and that's totally fine. I, um, yeah. I wouldn't feel comfortable enough to express my opinion on how Rust code should look like. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that makes fair. more sense. So you you know enough to get what you need to get done, but you're not like a you're not a Rust specialist. Yeah, I think that's a fair summary. Mm -hmm. So 
what is the state of Rusty CL at this point? It's uh, a good conformant OpenCL implement implementation on some Intel hardware. Mm -hmm. um, so I filed for official conformance uh, at the beginning of this year, I think. Mm -hmm. um, Yeah, so it's uh, passing, like, the OpenCL, um, there's, like, the conformance test suite, which a lot of tests, and I'm generally testing against that, so that is what basically works. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of applications are already running, I think. Oh, okay. it's, it's not, you know, it, it's not uh, enabled by default yet. Mm -hmm. um, just for s stupid reasons, or oh, it was actually last year, mm -hmm. end of last year, so kind of a year until uh, since it's conformant. Um, some OpenCL code is really, really heavy, and the way we are compiling code inside Mesa is that we basically inline everything into like one huge function doing everything. Okay. And this can lead to, you know, some benchmarks using like 30 gigabytes of memory or more, um, which is a problem. <laughs> so I, I'm not really comfortable enough to um, enable any devices by default yet because mm -hmm. of that. Because, you know, if you start something and your system goes out of memory because, like, because of that, and it's kind of bad. Um, but besides that, a lot of stuff is working. Um, recently, we also merged the support for uh, OpenGL sharing. So there's an OpenCL implementation to import OpenGL objects into your OpenCL implement, uh, application. Mm -hmm. And we had a student intern working on this, and they've done a lot of great work mm -hmm. on this. And I've main mentored him to you know, uh, to work on this project. And I'm very happy that we finally managed to merge it. I think it was like uh, the internship ended, it ended like nine or 10 months ago or something. And there was like still a lot of details to cover. And the student, like Antonio is his name, um, stick, stuck around and helped out with random bugs and putting it into proper shape. Mm -hmm. So, um, and with that, you can actually run applications like DaVinci Resolve uh, on Misa out of the box. Because I know that was one of the issues with um, with DaVinci. You, I think you, you needed to use the proprietary AMD GPU drivers to actually get anywhere with it previously. Yeah, that uh, that might be right. Because I know NVIDIA is... Um, I know that the... Sorry, go on. Um, yeah, I think there were issues the way they were... Inter like, the, the, the big problem with this GL sharing implementation is that it requires a private um, extension on the OpenGL side as well, mm -hmm. and the way AMD implemented it against Misa was kind of weird and probably not working well with... Mm -hmm. Um, Misa, but I also haven't really tried it. I, I know that, you know, debugging DaVinci Resolve is a mess because, you know, it, it starts, it starts like hundreds of threads. And every time there's a bug, then I look at GDP and it's like, oh yeah, thread number 500. It's like, oh yeah, okay, fine. Um, so it's, uh, it's heavily multi-threading and a lot of bugs could trigger just by, you know, doing stuff. Mm -hmm. And I know, for example, if the video... Um, if there's like a bug, then the video preview wouldn't show and stuff like this. It's, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's a mess. 